Good afternoon. Welcome to our Breastfeeding Basics class hosted by Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. And this is part of our Baby and Family Fair um, virtual series that we're doing. So we're glad to have you, glad to have you. I am Liz Miller. I am a registered nurse, um, international board certified lactation consultant. At least that's what they tell me all those initials stand for. I'm not gonna tell you how long that I have been a registered nurse, but I have been doing lactation. Uh, I would say for probably at least 18 years, if not a little bit longer. Um, I've been a registered nurse dealing with moms and babies, working postpartum, newborn nursery, and I feel like I've come full circle um, on board with lactation. It's truly um, um, been a wonderful uh, journey for me as well, one that I certainly enjoy. Sitting next to me today is Hope Richards. She is our newest team member to lactation, and we are so pleased and so happy to have her with us. Um, so I wanted her to be here today, and so we're going to be talking to you all about some um, breastfeeding basics. Just to take care of a little housework before we get going, if you have questions as we go, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to submit them, and we'll be monitoring them and uh, we will certainly get those answered for you. Um, I love to uh, start a class saying that one of my favorite parts is to learn the myths that are out there. Uh, what, are, what are we hearing about breastfeeding? And so anything that you have heard, whether it's good, bad, ugly, in between, um, please feel free to jot that down and let us know and we'll go through those for you. So wanna get started just a little bit and talk about the American Academy of Pediatrics and their policy statement on breastfeeding. And that is, they recommend exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of a baby's life. And then you'll start complimentary food. So from six months on, breastfeeding should still be a part of their diet, but it's in association with complimentary foods. And then a mom and baby should breastfeed as long as mutually desired. The benefits of breastfeeding and the breast milk, no matter how long a mom nurses, those benefits are always going to be there. And so I also like to start by saying that breastfeeding is not just a way to feed your baby, but it's also medicine for your baby. And as we get going this afternoon, you'll understand more what I mean by that. So once again, that's our statement. That's the American Academy of Pediatrics statement on breastfeeding. This is my time to take a few minutes to brag on Tallahassee Memorial because we are a baby-friendly hospital. We are a certified baby-friendly hospital. We are the only one uh, in the area. What really does that mean? That means that our staff has education and training and the importance of breastfeeding and helping moms and babies get off to a wonderful start. So we're very, very proud of that. But we also uh, recognize and we respect a mother's right to decide how she's going to feed her baby. And that is part of the baby friendly is that we just provide the education for the moms to make the best decision for themselves. So either way, we respect your choice and how you're going to feed your baby. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of breastfeeding. I know it seems like that's how most classes do get started. But I want to talk a little bit because that is what is so important. Benefits for the baby. Oh my goodness, where do I begin? It lowers the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. We all know about SIDS. Um, and we know that breastfed babies, it helps to protect those babies and there's a much lower risk of babies with SIDS. We also know that breastfeeding helps reduce uh, respiratory and um, tummy, diarrhea, vomiting, those kinds of things that sometimes those babies can, um, can develop as well. We know that it reduces ear infections. Absolutely it does. We also know that it um, helps to uh, lower the risk of certain childhood uh, leukemias, also diabetes. And boy, as we all know, uh, right now, diabetes isn't really epidemic proportions. So we know that babies who are breastfed have a much lower risk or at least decreases the risk of develop that, developing diabetes when they are older. It also protects babies against allergies, but more importantly, it really builds that baby's immune system. 
you know, I can say a lot of things about breastfeeding. I cannot stand up in here or sit here in front of you and say that if you breastfeed your baby, they're never going to be ill. But what I can tell you is that if you breastfeed your baby and provide human milk for your baby, you are building their immune system. You are preparing them for everything that they're going to come in contact with in the future. And so that when they are ill, they have that strong immune system so that they can fight things off much easier, much quicker. But, you know, I also like to talk about the benefits for moms to breastfeed. We know about the health benefits for babies, but what is the benefit for a mother? Well, I know for young ladies, you're not always thinking about this now, but for us older ladies, it lowers the risk of osteoarthritis and porosis later in life. So we know that it helps to give us protection um, later on. It also reduces our risk of certain ovarian cancers, breast cancer and uterine cancer. That is very important. It also um, decreases the risk of uh, anemia and infection in our mothers as well. It also too releases the hormone and that we helps our uterus to what we call involute or shrink after we have given birth. So there are many advantages for our moms and for our babies. So here at Tallahassee Memorial, what do we do? How do we get things going with breastfeeding? When a mom comes in and she delivers in labor and delivery, our nurses are trained. We train them as part of our baby-friendly hospital certification to work hands-on with the moms and babies starting in labor and delivery. And when that baby is born, it is so amazing that first couple of hours, they have a period of what we call quiet awake, quiet alert. It was, they're like, wow, what is going on here? Um, what just happened here? And so we put those babies skin to skin with mom right after they're born. We put them right there. We don't whisk them away to a warmer or out of the room. They're put right there with their mother. Imagine that, putting a baby with its mother. What were we thinking? Novel concept. Yes. Um, but why do we do that? Well, we do it for many reasons. First of all, the baby is placed with mom. The baby, it helps to regulate the baby's temperature. It helps to regulate the baby's breathing. It even helps with their blood sugar and also um, keeping them calm, keeping them with mom. They they can feel mom, they hear her heartbeat, they know that they're home. And so you keep mom and baby together, skin to skin. During that first hour or so, that baby is awake, that baby is kind of looking around like, what just happened here? That is the best time to get them started on the breast. Not so much that they're born hungry, but they're interested they're awake. And so that is the best time to get that baby latched on right there in labor and delivery. We know in the breastfeeding world that babies who breastfeed in labor and delivery, those moms and babies generally go on to be extremely successful with their breastfeeding journey. So very important that we, we do those things. And look, I know I'm a grandmother. And I know grandmamas, they are out there waiting. They want to see that baby. They want to get their hands on the baby. You know what? They got 18 years to do that. <laughs> that first couple of hours, you put that baby skin to skin with you and you start looking for those little babies feeding cues. And Hope, I'm going to let you let these folks know what exactly in a feeding cue we're looking for. Okay, well, there's um, lots of different feeding cues. The big ones that are super obvious, easy to see, our baby bringing that hand up to his mouth, sucking on those fingers, um, a baby who's smacking their lips or licking their lips, um, a baby that's looking all around, what we call rooting, um, or that's kind of pecking at mommy's chest if mom's holding mm -hmm. baby. Those are all your really obvious feeding cues. Absolutely. And that's the best time to get that baby to the breast and let that nurse help you. Because after that first couple of hours, that baby is, you know, they don't call it labor for nothing. Mama's tired. Our partners are tired. 
I guarantee you a little bit is tired too. And so usually at that point, everyone takes a nice long nap. Well, if we had a feeding on board with our baby, then we know, okay, everything is good. Let's everybody take a little nap, kind of get used to what's going on. And then when the baby wakes up, then we'll start things over again. So once we have left labor and delivery and we go up to our family care room, we do what is called rooming in. I know you have heard about rooming in. What exactly is rooming in? Rooming in is <clears throat> when that baby stays with mom, stays mo with mom in the same room. The baby has their own separate crib, but we keep that baby in the room with mom 24 hours. Baby doesn't really need to leave the nursery except for possibly a special procedure. But our nurses and our physicians come to the room. They examine the babies right there um, with, uh, with mom. And um, that way you're picking up on those feeding cues. You're hearing the smacking, your, the lips. You're able to get to that baby before we start with a crying. Crying is a very late hunger cue. Crying is that baby looking up at you saying, you know what, you find people. I was cueing just a few minutes ago and now uh, you kind of missed that. So now I'm not too happy. So crying is uh, at that point, they're kind of past their little, uh, their little uh, hunger. Uh, and they're very, yes, yeah, sometimes it can be a little tricky uh, to get them on. So keeping that baby in the room uh, with you guys. Um, and it also helps the moms to gain confidence with their baby. You know, you're, you're learning your baby. You're picking up on their cues. Uh, do I have a tummy? Do I need my diaper changed? Those kinds of things. So keeping that baby in there um, with you um, as well. Um, of course, if, um, if you're not feeling well um, and need to make sure that you have someone there with you, um, certainly you can, um, certainly we can do that as well. Uh, but that's very important with the, uh, with the rooming in. All right. So let me ask here, or let me just talk a little bit about how does our body make milk? How do our breasts know to make milk? Well, during pregnancy, we do start to make some milk. It's called colostrum. Colostrum is the first milk. I kind of call it super milk. Um, it's very high in protein. Um, some, we also kind of call it liquid gold because it has a high beta carotene content. So we start making that during the last trimester or so of pregnancy. Um, we don't walk around nine months pregnant with breasts full of milk because there's no baby to be born. So when that baby is born, we get that baby to the breast and they are receiving the milk. They're receiving colostrum. When babies are first born, their tummies are very, very small. They don't need a whole lot of food at, a, at the first feeding. And so the colostrum that they get, that's a small amount of colostrum, but once again, it's very high in protein. So it's like a little bit goes a long way. And so one of the other things too that I wanna mention, and I love to talk about this, and that is how human milk, how breast milk is species specific and how it changes over time. What do I mean by species specific? Well. Just like in the wild, a mother deer nurses her baby deer. Her milk is designed to provide everything she needs. She doesn't go and breastfeed all the other little animals, the raccoons, the squirrels. Their mother's milk is designed for that. Human milk was designed for a human baby. It has the right amount of fat, protein, vitamins, minerals, everything that that baby needs to grow and develop is provided through mom's milk, okay? So breast milk, over time, it also changes. So for about the first three days, mom has the colostrum. Around day three to five, our transitional milk starts to come in. What is that? Well, that's when mama notices her breasts are starting to get heavier, they're starting to get weightier as that milk is transitioning in, the transitional milk. It changes a little bit. The protein content actually drops, and that's when the fat content takes off. That's when those breastfed babies start gaining all of this good, healthy weight, okay? All babies are going to lose weight initially. They are. Uh, most of them, as long as we're, 
within that 7%, that's considered pretty normal, pretty routine. And then once that transitional milk comes in, then those babies will start gaining about a half an ounce to an ounce a day at that point in time. So you have milk. All mothers have colostrum when that baby is first born. It takes three to five days of mama nursing eight to 12 times in a 24 hour period, that means day and night, for that second milk to transition in. And so babies do need to get in eight to 12 good feeds in 24 hours, okay? That's what they need. Their little tummies are small, so they need those very frequent feedings, okay? So we give you three to five days with really good effective stimulation for that milk to come in. Now I tell, I'm probably about to blow some, some people's uh, minds right here, but I'm gonna tell it like it is, okay? Making milk has nothing to do with what we eat or drink. Let me say that one again. Making milk has nothing to do with what we eat or drink. Making milk has to do with stimulating the breast frequently. Basically, the more that you stimulate, the more milk you're going to make. And you actually have to remove the milk to make more milk. So that's how it all works. Has nothing to do with what we eat or drink. Now, I tell everyone, drink to thirst and eat to hunger. If you're thirsty, drink. If you're hungry, eat. And of course, we want to make sure that we're eating, you know, good, healthy, good, healthy meals. Um, but again, making milk is all about stimulating the breast. For a baby who may have to use our NICU or neonatal intensive care unit, and that baby is not ready to go to the breast, or for a baby who just doesn't quite know what he needs to do at first, then that's when we're going to get you set up using one of the hospital's electric breast pumps. We have them on the family care unit. We have them in the NICU. Uh, you do not need to bring in your own breast pump to the hospital because we have everything that you need when you come there. But we get those mamas set up with a pump. Why do we do that? Because we need the stimulation to the breast. And we're going to have her pump every three hours. She's mimicking with a breast pump what her baby should be doing. Because once again, making milk is all about stimulating the breast. So that's very, very important. And one other thing I too I, I like to mention is that um, what a mother eats can change the flavor of the breast milk. You know, this is where I kind of say formula is the same day one, day 10, day 100. It doesn't change. But human breast milk changes depending on what mom is eating. It has a different flavor. And then also it changes as the baby grows, providing the right amount of fats and proteins for that baby. So human milk is, is amazing um, for these babies as well. And once again, I always say that human milk is also medicine for a baby. We know that those tiny little babies in the NICU, when they're there, we get the mom started hand expressing and pumping and those special precious drops of colostrum, we get to that NICU for those nurses to provide that to those babies. Mm -hmm. Depending on what's going on, sometimes they'll feed it to the babies or they may just do oral care, but they know how important and how vital that milk is for that tiny baby. So I look at it this way, not only is it food, but it's also medicine for your baby. And then we have mature milk. So we have our colostrum. We have transitional milk. Mature milk comes in anywhere, day 10, day 12. Many mothers don't really recognize too much more. It may change a little bit in the, in the color. Um, but then that's what we have um, with, our, with our babies and with breastfeeding. So very, very important to understand how we make milk and how the body makes milk. And so it's really not normal for a mama not to make milk. There may be some women in the world who for certain hormonal reasons may have a concern or may have an issue with milk supply, 
but they're still able to provide the breast milk for their baby. And please know that any amount of human milk that a baby receives is of health benefit to this baby. So if we're able to provide all of the breast milk from the breast to the baby, that is wonderful. But any amount of human milk that a baby gets is certainly um, of health benefit to that baby. Uh, so do keep that um, in mind. So uh, any questions that we have so far? Have we seen, seen anything that. come through? Okay. Okay. Well, just to talk a little bit too um, about mom's diet, as we mentioned, making milk has nothing to do with what we eat or drink. But I always say you want to have a good, healthy diet. You want to make sure um, that we're eating well. And I tell you, usually breastfeeding mothers, I'll tell you, they say they, they probably need about 450 to 500 more calories a day that, you know, with, with their meal. Um, so do keep that in, in mind. Um, but what you choose, you know, babies like a wide variety of food because it changes the flavor of the milk. Um, so the only thing that I would say as far as possible recommendations or guidelines, if you will, is we do want to be real careful with um, certain fish, especially the big game fish because of the levels of mercury. Um, seafood and fish are wonderful sources of protein uh, for sure, but we want to make sure that um, we're choosing fish that's low in mercury and, and possibly watching the number of servings per week for sure. Um, I usually get questions about uh, caffeine, and I always like to mention this. Caffeine and pretty much anything, actually food, uh, medications, whether they're prescription over the counter, everything that we take in is passed to our baby through our breast milk. So with caffeine, we want to be careful with that. Caffeine actually stays in the breast milk probably a little longer than we thought. And so what does that mean? That means just to be really mindful of what you're taking in as far as caffeine. We get caffeine through tea, through sodas, through energy drinks, through coffee, even through chocolates. Um, and so, you know, if you're taking in more than we really need, that baby is going to be fussy. It's going to be irritable. Um, it may not be sleeping real well. So we want to, and we want to make sure that we're, we're monitoring and watching um, caffeine. So generally, probably in a day, something like two cups of coffee is probably what would be considered a, a fair amount of caffeine or a decent amount um, for that, for that breastfeeding mom. Um, if you're someone that likes to have um, a lot of caffeine, then we want to maybe switch and use a little decaf um, um, as we can for sure. Um, so just kind of being uh, mindful of the caffeine, alcohol, well, not that I'm encouraging everyone to go out there and, and have a big party, but I want to mention just a little bit about the um, alcohol. Um, if you're going and having a celebratory dinner, you know, we're maybe one night a week and we know that we may want to have a glass of wine and I mean the little small one, I don't mean the big guy, or maybe a beer or maybe a mixed drink. You notice I'm saying one here. I would feed my baby before I go out to dinner. I would enjoy myself and have my one drink. And that's usually pretty much if mom is not feeling the effects of the alcohol, it's pretty much through her system. But by the time you go out to dinner and come home, it's probably been two or three hours. And so it's pretty much through our system. But that's an occasional, that's very occasional. Um, so, you know, for sure, just kind of keep that in mind. Everything in moderation. Everything in moderation. Moderation is the key. Absolutely, it is. Well, let me make sure we have no more housekeeping issues that I need to make sure that we're uh, going to talk about. Um, I do want to go ahead and talk a little bit about latching on and should breastfeeding be painful? That's generally one of the first questions that I always get. Well, breastfeeding should never be painful. It should not, it, you may feel, you're going to feel a pull or a tug when your baby latches on, but we should not have any nipple breakdown. There should be no bleeding, no damaged nipples, no cracking. I don't want a mama curling her toes when it's time to feed her baby. So in that situation, if that's what's going on, then we definitely want to get some help um, from a lactation consultant. Absolutely, we do. And uh, just to let you all know here at Tallahassee Memorial, 
before mother's discharge, we do give um, information for follow-up services. We have telephone triage. So we make our, we do phone calls, we can um, return our calls. We also have a once a week breastfeeding support group. Currently it's at a woman's place on Sixth Avenue. Um, and so that is a wonderful place for babies and moms who are latching that may just need a little tweaking a little bit, or maybe a mom wants to do a pre and post feeding weight to see how much milk per baby is transferring. But for those moms who really have some issues and their baby is not latching, then we want to work with you one-on-one -on -one as an outpatient. And so we do offer our outpatient services where you call in and you speak with one of us and we go ahead and we set up that appointment for you. So there are many opportunities for follow-up once a mom has been discharged. But it's very important, and wouldn't you say, Hope, to get that baby latched on well? Definitely. 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 If, if you're doing something that's painful or that you're dreading, you're not going to stick with it. And so we want to make sure that you're comfortable and confident with your breastfeeding journey and that you feel supported and that you know all the community resources that you have. Absolutely. And so once again, our nurses are trained. They also know and they notify us in the hospital if there is a mom and a baby that are having specific um, issues um, and then we'll go and see them. Um, we do have um, coverage there uh, daily. Well, one of my favorite um, things to talk about, and I tell you, I always say if I had a nickel for every time I talked about this, I could probably retire. And that is how do I know that my baby is getting enough to eat? My goodness. Well, I tell you what, the way that we know that is we're gonna be keeping up with our baby, keeping up with the feedings. You know, we're looking to get in those eight to 12 good breast feeds in 24 hours feeling the good pull, knowing that that baby's doing the good long jaw pulls and we're gonna hear swallowing. Those first couple of days, we're gonna get you know, a few swallows here and there, but when that second milk transitions in, by day three, four, and five, we should be hearing many audible swallows and some gulping. And think about it, common sense. If the breast is a little bit full and the baby nurses and the breast is softer, Obviously, he is transferring and removing the milk. But the most important thing that you can do is keep up with your baby's wet and poopy diapers. Mm -hmm. What's going in is coming out. So I always tell everybody, take it that first week. Uh, we don't really count delivery day. But on day one, your baby should have one good wet and one good poopy diaper. Hey, more than that, we have a little overachiever. Day two, we're looking for two wets and two poopy diapers. By day three, we're looking for three wets and three poopy diapers, and that's within a 24-hour period. Day four, you're looking for four wets and four poopy diapers. And I know some of you out there are going, um, okay, uh, Miss Liz, when does this uh, kind of start uh, slowing down? By day five, and then from then on, your baby should have six to eight wet diapers a day. That's a 24-hour period. And by day five, four or more yellow, loose, seedy bowel movements. Mm -hmm. That's the color of that breastfed baby's bowel movements. And let me tell you, the seediness comes from the solid portion of human milk. You know, the big difference between human milk and formula, human milk is higher in the liquid portion. Actually, breast milk is 87% water and the rest solid. Formula is a complete opposite. It's higher in the solid portion, lower in the liquid. So breast milk goes through a system, goes through the baby system quicker. That is true, but it goes through easier. It's more easily digest for that baby. Formula is heavier on the solid portion, so it's going to sit in their gut longer. They may not feed as often, but that's not necessarily the, the best thing. They usually do not have as many bowel movements um, as the breastfed baby. So a breastfed baby should really never be constipated. They should be having good wets and good poopy diapers. And so we encourage all of our moms that, you know, to, to certainly track that because that gives you confidence and that gives you reassurance that your baby is getting what they need. And then once those babies, once that second milk comes in, then we're looking for that baby to gain, like I said, about a half an ounce to an ounce a day after you've been discharged and that second milk is coming in. 
if we're not noticing those things or if we have concerns, then that's when we would encourage you to certainly contact us um, and let us know so that we can uh, get you in and start working to see what's going on there. Cluster feeding. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Hope talk about this oh, one just gosh. a little bit. I know, I know. But we all see this in the hospital. I like to prepare you guys yeah. ahead of time because I think if you know that this is normal and what to expect, then it's going to help you. And so I'm going to let Hope talk about okay. that. So we call it second night syndrome because it tends to happen right around baby's second night. It happens the world over, not just here in the U.S. Babies of Africa and in Asia and Europe do it too. So we know that it's completely normal for babies to do this. What we theorize is happening is it's baby's way of helping bring in mom's second milk a little bit quicker. Um, like Miss Liz was saying earlier, that frequent and thorough removal of the milk, that stimulation of the breast is what tells our body to make more milk. So it makes sense that if baby's clustering, if baby's feeding very, very frequently, then our body is saying, hey, let's get moving. Let's make more milk. Um, so that's what we think is happening. When cluster feeding happens, it can be a little disconcerting for our parents. They can get a little bit worried. Oh gosh, is my baby actually getting anything? I see these couple little drops and this baby seems to always want the breast. Well, when you cluster feed, when baby cluster feeds, um, it's going to seem like you have two arms, two legs, and a baby mm -hmm. attached to your breast mm -hmm. because that baby is going to want to be on your breast the entire time. They may or may not like dad at that point in time. They more than likely are just going to want to be right there on mommy. Um, and they are absolutely going to despise their bassinet. <laughs> and that's just kind of life for that little bit of time. Um, it is completely normal for the baby to want to feed extremely frequently, you know, hourly, sometimes even more than that. Um, and the rest of the time, even when they're not hungry, to want to be right there beside the breast. Um, so don't let that surprise you or take you, take you back if it happens. It doesn't mean anything's wrong. It doesn't mean you're not making milk. Actually, the exact opposite is happening. Mm -hmm. Baby's just helping you get in the gear to make more. And what, what we like to say or what I like to say sometimes on that second night is that that first night, the baby's kind of like, well, I'm not really sure what happened. That second night, they wake up and they realize, well, you know, my uh, direct deposit uh, is gone. I've lost my jacuzzi. And so they figure if I'm going to survive in this world, then I better figure this out. And so that becomes like a little marathon of that baby figuring it out and nursing to bring in that second milk. So uh, we always like to talk about that so that folks are, are well prepared, um, as we should say. Uh, talk just a little bit too. Um, we uh, want to mention about, um, we talked about medications um, we talked about things that we take in our past through our breast milk. So when it comes to obviously, um, whether there, there's many drugs over the counter, I wouldn't, we wouldn't recommend, but obviously illegal street drugs uh, do not go hand in hand with breastfeeding because of course the baby would get that passed through them through the breast milk and it can have very serious side effects to that. So uh, obviously on that one, we, we wouldn't recommend uh, that particular mom uh, nursing, at least at that time. Um, we do have one question that was submitted. It says, can you breastfeed if you have low milk supply? And the answer is yes, you can breastfeed with low milk supply. We're going to work with you and I would recommend working with a lactation consultant to see why we have that low milk supply. Is there something that we can do to help turn that around to increase that supply? Usually there is, there really is. But even if a mom has a low milk supply, if she's needing to supplement, she's still providing her breast milk for her baby, building that baby's immune system and setting them up for everything else that they're going to receive um, the rest of their, their life. Now, one of the scenarios that I like to talk about, too, because we, we, we typically sometimes we uh, get phone calls about this. So mom and dad or mom and our partner, we're, we're at home and we're breastfeeding and mama's been nursing every two to three hours, doing great, baby's transferring well, good wets and good poopy diapers, things are going well. And mama is exhausted. Mama is exhausted. So she nurses that baby, say around 10 o'clock at night. Everyone goes to sleep. Well, the baby wakes up about one or 1.30. 
And so our partner gets up with the baby and the partner doesn't have the heart to wake mommy up. And for some, maybe mama had some pumped breast milk in the refrigerator, whatnot. So the partner goes ahead and feeds the baby. Okay, well, I get that the baby got fed. So now the baby's going back to sleep for another three or four hours, probably another three hours. So the next time mommy wakes up, it could have been six hours since she's last done anything with her breast. Well, we cannot turn those breasts on and off, okay? We need to keep the milk moving because if we don't, the body goes, oh, I guess I don't need this. And we don't want that to back up. We don't want mom to get uncomfortable or getting, or getting gorged. We don't want to create a problem where we don't have one. So as much as our partner wants to help mom, the best thing to do would be to you know, gently wake her up and have her feed the baby. And then once mom is done feeding the baby, well, then that's when our partner can take the baby and we can rock and we can do whatever we need to do and, and let mama go back to sleep. But we want to make sure that if we're nursing, that we're doing so that we're emptying our breasts at least eight to 12 times. And that includes during the night, we need to keep that milk moving um, so that it doesn't um, back up for okay. sure. Okay, Miss Liz, it looks like we have a question and it's okay. a pretty important one. Okay. So it's can a mom with a baby in the NICU breastfeed? And I think this one's pretty close to both of our hearts. It is. So the answer is absolutely. Um, and I'll let you go ahead. No, that is, that, that's absolutely right. Now, depending on the age and the, what is going on with the baby at the time, many of the NICU babies at that moment may not be able to actually go to the breast, but that mama will be set up initiating pumping and hand expressing and bringing her milk in. And at some point with that baby, once the baby is stable and the NICU medical team has given the mom the okay, we do skin to skin in that NICU. We encourage that very much so, putting that baby there a lot of times we'll start letting that baby just lick, just smell, nuzzle, get comfortable there. And then we start practicing with that baby in the NICU. As soon as that baby is stable and ready to do so, that is the best time to get that baby um, to the breast. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, they can breastfeed once they are stable uh, mm -hmm. in the NICU. So very good question. Yeah. So we just have to keep that milk moving for mommy until right. baby's able to come to that breast. Absolutely. So super important for you to start pumping as soon as you can. Absolutely. Um, and keep that milk moving, keep that supply up. That way we have plenty of milk for when baby comes back to the breast. That's exactly right. Because if that we want that breast milk to be and we want mama's supply to be up. And so that way when the baby is on the breast, that baby can is actively suck it and, and, and just goes to tail. So absolutely. That's an excellent question. That yeah. was a great question. Awesome, awesome. Um, feeding our baby like on demand, watching the feeding cues. That's what on demand feeding is, that we're feeding them when they're queuing. Now, obviously those new babies, those first weeks for sure, probably even past the first few weeks, we wanna make sure that for a sleepy baby, we're obviously waking that baby up to feed and we're making sure that they're getting in those eight to 12 good breastfeeds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so very good. Um, talk a little bit more here. Um, have any more questions coming in, just let us know. Any, any question is certainly fine. Um, once again, uh, reminding moms that um, we should have no nipple breakdown. We shouldn't have any trauma to the nipples. If we do, then we want to make sure that we're following up with a lactation consultant to get that um, squared away and taken care of. Different positions for breastfeeding. There are many positions, ways to hold a baby to breastfeed. I kind of have a saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but we'll work with you in the hospital and it's not important that a new mom learn to do every position that's available. I say find one for sure that you're comfortable, maybe two um, that you're comfortable with learning. Um, and as you and your baby go on your breastfeeding journey, then you'll become more comfortable trying different positions. We do offer a once a month uh, prenatal breastfeeding class. Um, in fact, I think that's going to be held just to let you know, um, on May 23rd, and we, you can register at tmh.org, um, 
for our classes. And so that is actually an excellent class. I would encourage you to, uh, to participate in that if you can. I think you'll be very, very pleased. There's a lot of hands-on with uh, their dolls, obviously, but they're for breastfeeding. And so we work with positioning there to kind of give you an idea um, of what, what we're looking for and what you should see and what you should feel uh, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, breast pumps. Uh, usually I get questions about breast pumps. Um, I tell everyone right now to check with your insurance companies. Many of the insurance companies are providing um, some breast pumps for their moms. Um, so make sure that you do follow up with them uh, for a good breast pump. Um, that's very, very important. We like the double electric pumps, especially if you're going to be going back to work, uh, for sure. Any questions that you may have regarding what do I need uh, as far as pumping? What do I need for breastfeeding? I know there are many, many things that are out there today on the market for mommies. You know, certainly you can give us a call if you like, and um, we can talk you through some of those if you have any questions or concerns about those. Uh, Anything else that we have coming through there? I'm just making sure that I have covered everything um, that is on our list. Pacifiers. Let me mention a little something about pacifiers. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that babies, when they're being placed down to sleep, that you use a pacifier. They know that it reduces the risk of SIS, sudden infant death syndrome. But their, their statement on breastfeeding is that we wait several weeks, maybe around three weeks or so, to get lactation off to a good start. Let's get mama's second milk in. Let's get that baby gaining weight. Let's get um, things going well, that we know things are going the right direction before we introduce something to that baby, something different. Um, so that's their statement really about the, uh, the pacifiers for sure, okay? So one question that we got is, what if I have trouble breastfeeding once I get home? So like Ms. Liz had mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, we got lots of outpatient resources for you guys. Mm -hmm. So um, we do telephone triage. We, we're, we give everyone our phone number um, when they're leaving the hospital. And so you'll have our contact information. Mm -hmm. um, we're also offering telehealth. We do um, weekly breastfeeding support, support group. group. We do. That is a great option if baby's lashing okay, but mommy just wants to, us to help tweak some things or just mm -hmm. wants to see what exactly baby's transferring at that feeding. Support group can be a great option. Um, and then we're also, we offer outpatient appointments. Mm -hmm. So a mom can call us and we can kind of see what's going on. And if we need to, we can bring her in and work one-on-one -on -one with her to try to really dig in deep and figure out what's going on. Right, right. So any of those things, any of those options um, after your discharge are certainly available to you. We want every mom to get the help um, that they can, that they need um, for, um, for their, for their babies. So, well, it has been our pleasure. We got another question. question. Okay. Okay. What happens if I have a clogged gut? Well, you know what? Let's talk a little bit about that. A plug duct or a clog duct can be very painful and it's generally in just one particular part of the breast, meaning the duct. And if you look at, at the breast, just to kind of do a little basic anatomy here, the breast, if you think of it as having all these tree branches around it, and those are like the ducts where the milk actually comes through. Notice that we use the term breastfeeding and not nipple feeding. We want that baby back deep on that breast, not just on the nipple. The nipple is just how the milk comes out. So we want the baby back, really almost behind the areolas, compressing those milk ducts for effective milk removal. And so if we have that, then we shouldn't have the plug duct or the plug duct. But if we notice that we have something like that and we're like, okay, what is going on here? When your baby is on the breast, you can do a little gentle massage of that little plug duct to see if that baby cannot remove that milk. Um, certainly, you, you know, try that to see if that baby cannot pull that out. Um, if it gets to be too um, uncomfortable, or if you start to run a fever, that's a little different situation, then we would follow up with a physician. But most moms can, you know, get that baby on. Sometimes you can even change the positioning, the angle that the baby is going to the breast. Uh, we may want them to try a different way so that baby can compress that particular part um, of the breast to get that milk removed. Um, and that's, that's different. A plug duct 
it's a little bit uncomfortable. Usually a mom and a baby can kind of work through that um, to get that resolved. Mastitis is a, is a little bit different. That's a breast infection where mom is ill and running a fever and that requires mom to follow up with her physician on that. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, guys. So what do I do if my baby will only nurse on one side? That is a great question. Sometimes, sometimes babies are kind of a little positional at first and they may prefer one over the other. Doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the other breast. But what we need to know is that we have to stimulate both breasts. So if your baby is nursing on just one breast, make sure that you are using your breast pump to pump that other breast about every three hours, getting that needed stimulation. So once we can kind of maneuver and get that baby on that breast, we want to make sure that supply is there. So that is an excellent question. If you don't, you know, tip, you only have one, you know, one baby and he only wants to go on one breast and not the other nursing on that breast, of course, but then make sure you're pumping and stimulating the other side. Okay. How do I know how much and when to supplement breastfeeding with formula? That is a great question. So that goes back to keeping up with the wets and the poopy diapers, depending on the day of age, the day of life that your baby is. Are they starting to gain weight? If we're gaining weight, we're following up with our pediatrician. They have no concerns about the weight gain and the baby is wetting and pooping and is seeming to be content. Then I would say we don't need to, to supplement that baby. But in the hospital, if there are concerns, the nurses and they'll always in lactation and the pediatricians there will be watching what's going on with that baby. Are we having a wet and poopy? Is there something they're concerned about? If there is, then they will be the ones in the hospital to discuss that with the mom um, and her partner uh, and the baby, uh, and, the, and the, for sure. I think there's another question. Is there a point when you'll know when your body won't produce breast milk anymore? Um, well, if you are weaning, in other words, as long as you are stimulating the breast, whether it is by the baby or the pump, and you're doing it frequently enough, okay, then your body is getting the signal to make the milk. That's what we want. The body has to get the signal to make that breast milk. So the longer that we go in between not putting our baby to the breast, the longer we go if we're not pumping and we should be, then the body doesn't get the message that I need to make milk. It's getting the message, oh, we don't have a hungry baby anymore, so I don't need to make the milk. Mm -hmm. So when a mother is ready to wean her baby or wean from pumping, we recommend doing so gradually, okay? So she's gonna do that gradually. Um, but the milk sh should not just, uh, it doesn't just stop. As long as that baby is nursing and mama is pumping and or pumping, we're stimulating the breast so the brain is getting the message. If we're doing all of those things and there's something going on with supply, then we need to look at that for a, a different reason at that point. Okay. What is the ideal amount of time, hours, to go between breastfeeding when the baby is a newborn? Well, that's a great question. You know, if we have a normal term healthy baby, those are very important words, aren't they, Miss Hope? Oh, yeah. Normal term healthy baby, no one's worried about anything. You know, I'm going to be honest, from birth to about 24 hours of age, they're not feeding around the clock. That baby's not been on a clock in utero. He's been doing gymnastics and getting his direct deposit. So he has no idea about time. So you're feeding that baby. You're watching those feeding cues. Generally, that first 24 hours on a normal term, healthy baby, you know, getting in three or four really good breast feeds. I mean, I'm going to be honest, I'm pretty happy with, with that. Now, when 24 hours rolls around, that's a different, that's a different situation. That's when we need to get in eight to 12 breastfeeds on that baby, uh, not only to build your supply, but that's what they need to grow. Yeah. So there's not an exact time. You're looking at baby's feeding cues. You're looking based on that. Right. Basically. Now we'll be honest. Um, you're not going to let a baby, you know, if your baby hasn't fed and you're going on four hours, I'd be waking that baby up and putting that baby skin to skin with me, kind of putting them in the kitchen, uh, let them start kind of realizing, okay, yeah, we need to get something going and feed them. And sometimes there are some babies that are re really sleepy and we have to do a little more work with them. Yeah. Do some moms have trouble with breastfeeding their first child, but are successful with the second? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, they are. Absolutely. And I'll tell you something. 
our bodies, our breasts tend to grow a little bit more glandular milk making tissue uh, with each subsequent pregnancy. You know what, making milk and how much milk a mother makes doesn't really have anything to do with the size of her breasts. You know, fatty tissue um, can make a woman have large breasts, but we're looking, milk is made in the glandular tissue. So the size of a woman's breast do not indicate how much milk she can make uh, for her baby. But uh, many mothers uh, with that second and third baby notice, well, I might've had a little issue with that first one, but look, you know, this is a little bit different. And I will tell you, um, just as a mom myself, having had three children, they're all different and they're all going to, they're all going to do things a little bit different. It's kind of like learning a dance with a new partner. And so you have to kind of figure out that, that baby. So what worked for one may or may not work for that second baby. What works for one mom may or may not work for another mother. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long per breast do you put baby before switching? Ah, I love that question. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I want your baby to get their hors d'oeuvres, their soup, their salad, their entree, their dessert from one breast if we can. Basically, leave that baby on as long as they want. It's not the length of time that causes Mm -hmm. sore nipples. It is actually um, the improper positioning. So if your baby's on there, well, leave them on. I really like them to get at least a good 15, 20 minutes longer, a good feeding on that breast. So if you got a sleepy baby and he's nursed for maybe five or 10 minutes, which really is not, we need a little bit longer than feeding. And he comes off and you're kind of rousing him, burping him, kind of trying to get him interested. I'd actually bring him back to the same breast he was on because I want him to really get um, a good full feeding from that breast and really drain, help mom to drain that breast. If that baby's been on 15, 20 minutes, comes off, burps, looks at you like I'm really ready for more dessert here, then yes, ma'am, I would go ahead and offer that other breast. So the answer is sometimes they'll feed from both breasts at a feeding. Sometimes it will only be one. That's okay. And yes. Um, what do I do if my baby is gnawing on the nipple instead of sucking? Oh boy, we sometimes we, we see that in the hospital. Sometimes they they just don't know what to do. They're a little bit disorganized. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're kind of biting or chewing or whatnot. Well, I would say first of all, you're going to get some help from the nurse and from the lactation, so we can kind of figure out. Sometimes there's some little things that we can kind of do to kind of see what's going on with that baby. How can we help that baby get into a good rhythmical suck? Um, if it continues and we're not getting that baby to do what the baby needs to do, or if it's just too painful for mom, then we are going to go ahead and get her set up pumping. Because remember, the first rule when we're going to feed the baby as well. We're going to feed our baby, but we don't want to compromise mom's milk making. Mm-hmm. So we've got to get that stimulation to the breast, either by that baby or by the breast pump. Okay, what should I do if I'm sick while I'm breastfeeding? You're going to continue to breastfeed, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically, if you're sick, by the time you realize that your baby's already been exposed and your baby needs your breast milk to continue to build that immune system, fight off anything that they may have. Um, There are certain situations where a mother may need to be, um, the baby can have the breast milk, but they just don't want them in close contact with the mom. So in certain certain situations, a lot of times we refer to the CDC um, to see what their latest recommendations are. But if you're talking about a mom having a cold or she's got the flu, first of all, mom needs to take care of herself. Mom needs to make care, take care that she's getting rest, that she's getting fluids, that she's getting what she needs for sure, but she can still breastfeed if she needs to put, if she's coughing and sneezing and wants to put a little mask on, certainly she can nurse the baby and then she needs to hand that baby off so she can get the rest that she needs. But that baby still needs all the benefits of that, needs it even more um, from her human milk. Mm -hmm. Your breast milk has all kinds of antibodies in it, so that actually helps protect baby better than you know, given a bottle of formula or something else. Absolutely. Because those antibodies are what's going to protect baby and build that immune system. Yes, that's all. Well, I think that we are at the end of our time. Uh, We have certainly enjoyed being here uh, with you and we appreciate 
uh, the questions and please feel free anytime to give us a call in the lactation office. Um, if you have further questions, we'll be certainly happy to take those for you. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Um, and remember, if you'd like to take that prenatal breastfeeding class, remember that you um, it's a two hour class and you can sign up on that for, at tmh.org. Um, slash classes. Um, so that is there. And the next one is May 23rd. And we hope you join us for the remainder of our baby and family fair virtual speaker series. Our next panel is actually tomorrow, Thursday, April 28th at 12 p.m. And they're covering how to prevent childhood injuries and recognizing signs of abuse and neglect. So there's still time for you guys to sign up for that as well. And we hope you have a wonderful day and the rest of your evening. Have a good one, y'all.